go live, and here we are. Okay, everyone. Good afternoon, BC here, and welcome to another exciting episode of the BC Motor Tech Tuesday. Hope everything is well. Here at the BC Motor facility, and let me move this around a little bit. Hello, C. Perez, good seeing you this afternoon. And for those of you on YouTube, thank you for joining us. Make sure that you are okay. Yes, you are. And for those of you listening on the podcast uh, via the different mediums that we explore, thank you so much for joining us on this Tech Tuesday where we talk tech and more. Hello, that Kelly Life. Two cams, good seeing you. Civic, B. Dot. Jesse, you can. Write to me at lab at bcmo.com. Send me your resume and maybe we can make some magic happen together. Hello, Project PRI. Good seeing you. What's up, Civic? Good seeing you. Good afternoon, Kelly Life. Fox, good seeing you. All the way from the Orange County, Logan joins us. Hello, Logan. Nathan from Honda, tell him I said hi as well. Richard, I'm not doing any backflips today, by the way. Hello, Christopher, shark boy. Dan, the man, FG4. Hello, sir, good seeing you as well. AJ, all the way from the UK. Thank you for joining us as well. It's Teco, what up, 88EY. I was just here talking to Duran from, who helps me quite a bit here from uh, Pirate Auto. We're talking about pulsing pulsing inside of fuel rails and how we use larger fuel rails to help dampen pulses that exist with injectors. But many times, if you have a really rough idle from very large injectors, you can have pressure waves that exist inside and it could upset each injector and cause lean spots. So I'm going to experiment later this week on how to dampen those and hopefully have some great information for you guys next week, which is great. New Orleans, C. Higgins in the house. Good seeing you. Thank you so much, Clay. Good to have you. Marvels, good to see you as well. Greetings, everyone. Um, is this your contact at AM Intakes? Who are you? Chris, yeah, Chris is. Absolutely, Fox, he is. Shirts off for the ladies. Okay, let me just do it. No, I can't do that because a lot of guys get upset. Um, yes, it does, Sam. Sam was instrumental to the look at this. Look at that sick exhaust right there. That's courtesy of Sam there. Thank you so much, Sam. Connecticut is in the house indeed. Thank you so much, that Cali Life 818, saying that I'm very informative. I am here to help. Wishing that I had the same opportunity when I was much younger, when I first got into motorsports. And I'm here to help with anything I can do to make your life much easier, you know? Thank you so much, Danigga. Appreciate the kind words indeed. Greetings from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Beautiful. Thank you, Jay Fever. Good seeing you as well. And guys, Tech Tuesdays today. And I promised one of the guys on Instagram that I will talk today about coding. So, I was gonna grab a sample, but let's talk about that. You may have seen what I posted on Instagram earlier in the week um, about you know the whole crazy Black Friday set we had where I lost my mind, I was blowing things out. There's a piston set that was there with a brown top. Hello, Papa Juan, good seeing you, Sam. Um, and there was a black skirt coating. Now, those coatings are very instrumental to success of an engine, especially when it comes to improving efficiency. The ceramic barrier on the top, which is like a brownish color, almost like the color of this shirt, that does a great job in allowing you to keep the heat of combustion in the combustion chamber where it belongs, where it can do more work on the piston dome. So it doesn't allow the piston to absorb as much heat that can be done towards making more power for you. We've seen a five to 8% improvement in power on just ceramic coatings alone on the dome of pistons, both NA and turbocharged. And they're not, you don't just spray something on there. There's a very nice way to bond that to the piston top, which is cool. And as you remember, I've talked about this many times before. En engines are nothing but glorified energy converters. Yes, my roll call indeed. Energy converters where we take the energy in oxygen combined with the fuel and the caloric content of the fuel, so that's chemical energy. Through the event of combustion, we have this very nice explosion that occurs. So now it converts that chemical energy to heat energy via combustion. That heat energy then does work on top of the piston, which is converted to mechanical energy, up and down motion, which is then turned to rotational motion via the crankshaft. So anything you can do to prevent that heat from being dissipated into the surroundings, being absorbed by the combustion chamber, being absorbed by the valves, being absorbed by the sleeves, being absorbed by the piston, can help create more opportunities for work on the piston top, hence being more power. Above and beyond, that friction is very important. As you can see, I represent the guys from Pirol. I love their stuff. They're from aerospace, and they do a great job in friction reduction. But one way to take that a step further is by reducing the friction of the skirts on the cylinder walls. And how you can do that is a molly coating. So that helps a very good way by coating up pistons of molly on the skirt and allowing that to happen. And that process is not very expensive. For many of you who are four-cylinder engine lovers, that process is about anywhere from $160 to $200 for a set of four, which is way worth it. 
as you can imagine, that's less than most exhaust systems, and you make more power than a typical exhaust system. Thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words, everyone. What am I going to do, Ivalon, saying, with that MR2 I picked up? I haven't decided yet. So I have two options, I would say. Do a crazy swap with an engine from a different marquee, one that's very popular and can really wake that thing up like crazy, or use a base Toyota engine and make parts for that, which would be more involved and could take much longer, you know. Is the efficiency of using heat the reason why F1 engines are so crazy? Absolutely. You know, F1 engines, not only do they, are they designed to use heat efficiently, even how the exhaust is routed on the bodies help with aerodynamics. They really take motorsports to the highest level. Do a Cayman engine swap. That would be nice, but um, right here, I'm going to show you this. I don't know if you can see this, but I have a Cayman engine right there. See how big that is? That will not really fit very well in the confines of a AW11. That's very small. Hello, Jim. Good seeing you. AJ, good afternoon. Good seeing you. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Thank you so much. Oh, good, Geisha. By all means, I love that stuff in, in well. J Series is also a pretty large engine, which will be, even though the V is not super wide, it will be a bit of a challenge to fit in there. I may end up staying with something in line four. So that's something all of you can also easily replicate as well. I mean, I don't want to create a project that's absolutely impossible for any of you to be able to replicate. I'm here to help. So demand FD4 is telling me I should case swap a Porsche. It's been done already, and my fans, I wouldn't say my fans, but my Porsche enthusiasts will kill me. My customers would not be happy with that. Um, I should probably just case swap the MR2 over there. That'd be really cool, wouldn't that, you know? So Lil Thug is asking how's the AW11 project going. We are just talking about that for you just joining us, Lil Thug. Um, the engine is out. We have got to a point where we're going to decide if we're going to put um, a, an inline four from another marquee that can be very straightforward and very exciting for everyone, or stay with the umbrella of Toyota. You know, um, wagon what horsepower? Nothing yet. That's crazy. I can tell you one thing. I've been very busy, so um, I'm doing some testing with some fuel components, and. Even at low boost, she's making 660. So I can't tell you much yet, but I want to be able to show you that. I was just talking to Duran about that a moment ago. Low boost, which is pretty exciting. Beams, that is a very expensive engine that doesn't make a lot of power. I'm a big power guy, but good suggestion. Thank you so much. Hello, high class customs, good seeing you. My favorite fuel to run, I like methanol because of its caloric content as you combust it in the same amount of air, not caloric content per volume of fuel, but per volume of air combusted, how much heat can generate. I love the cooling aspect of it. I am not too crazy about its affinity for water being hygroscopic. So it is a hygroscopic fuel and also needs pickling. It needs a lot of attention. So, but it's my favorite fuel to make power with. The most user-friendly favorite fuel I would say is E85. I find that extremely appealing indeed, you know? Um, oh, nice. There's one in Australia, little thug. We should probably be brothers from across the world. One in Australia, one in America. I may end up doing that, which is pretty nice, you know. Hydro what? JP Farrell saying hydroscopic. So it's hydroscopic, which means it has affinity for water. If you allow methanol or ethanol to sit in an open container, it will become diluted with moisture from the atmosphere. It will pull moisture from the atmosphere and become more and more water-ish, if that's a word, you know. Do I quote external parts in engine to cut down heat soak? Absolutely, I do. So if you look at even the Wago van that I, that I just built recently, there's extensive use of coatings on the engine bay, uh, ceramic battery coatings on the exhaust, on the turbine, on the um, adapter from the turbine to the exhaust manifold, um, quite a bit. And if you look at this Porsche right here, you see that black coating that you see is actually quite dark. That's not just for looks. It's not just a black coating that is, I would say, What's a good word? It's not for aesthetics. It is a ceramic barrier coating to keep heat so that the heat can help scavenge even better with the exhaust. Yes, hygroscopic, absolutely. Saluda as well, Jaime, good seeing you as well. Uh, transaction will be tricky. Not only would a transaction be tricky with a 1J, the 1J is a pretty long and heavy engine. I want something much lighter, you know? I'd like to see an Earth Dreams diesel swap in MR2. Please have a great day. Have a great day to you as well, Wagon Mike 42. Thank you so much. I have pumped several 85 and 5 gallon jugs closed for about five months now. Is it still good to use? Yes. If it's sealed, yes. What I tend to do with 
storage of any hygroscopic um, uh, fuel is to have it slightly elevated off the floor. So I used to have a wood block and I elevate it from the floor because it can weep moisture from the ground, which is pretty interesting. So yes, by all means. CDI Motorsport, good seeing you as well. Hello, Mohammed Nars. Cerakote, I think that is a brand name for a type of coating. Uh, Hospara El Push, which one? We have quite a few here, please let me know. How long have you been working with cars? So, properly working with vehicles, I'll say, wow, since 1994, I would say. Um, so that's over 24 years I've been working with vehicles quite a bit. Hello, Obi Wanza, good seeing you. Good seeing you as well. I'm glad you can make it as well, Mohammed. Thank you so much. That wing in the background, thank you. That's courtesy of APR. They're actually quite here in Pomona, nearby. Very big on CFD analysis. It's not just for looks. It does a very good job in creating absolute downforce to, for impeccable adhesion to the tarmac when racing. It's a design that was very nicely uh, put together on the red one that's right here next to me. You can see the front end of the red one. And that was the base model that uh, Sam helped with as well. And now we have this, which is pretty cool. You know? Cheers as well, Paco. Good seeing you. 996 Outlaw has a complex question. He says, soon cars are going to be electric. In a Tesla with four motors, why do you need the wheels turning? Why not just increase the drag on wheels in a tank? In a Tesla with four motors, why do you need the wheels turning? Why not just increase the drag on the wheels like a tank? So I'm asked, I think what you're saying is, why not use the wheels to vector and why turn the car at all? It gives for a very interesting feedback to the driver. So you know how tanks are steered. You have to be very comfortable driving that. But the average enthusiast who is used to a two-wheel drive vehicle and how the vehicles turn may find vectoring a little bit uncomfortable. Now, you can do that, and you can use that in combination. And some current vehicles do use the wheel vectoring to turn the car. You can do it, but it's primarily feedback for drivers. And if I were to design a car for myself, solely for myself, I'd love to vector all day. But if I'm going to build a car for the masses, I need to do something that's very comfortable for the average enthusiast or the average consumer. Hope that makes sense. Mike Boss asked another EV question. What are my thoughts on electric sports car? I think it's absolutely fantastic. So I love going fast no matter what, whether it's internal combustion engines or a, a combination of the two, like this hybrid right here. That was my first foray into the hybrid world. It has an integrated motor assist, where it has an EV motor and generator in between the gearbox and the internal combustion engine. So that gave me a little bit of taste of that. And one thing I love about electric motors is you can have 100% torque at 1 RPM. So you can have full torque at 1 RPM. You can have a lot of fun. If anything, you have to program the inverters to be able to create opportunities to where the car can feel a little natural for people. Because years ago, we did something with a company that's no longer around here called Aptera. They were in the Oceanside area. It was a full EV company, um, a bit of a startup. And the cars look, you can see it on my YouTube page. So if you go on a BC Model YouTube page and type in Aptera on our feed, you'll see it. And it's this weird, plain looking vehicle. And the way this thing took off was absolutely fantastic. And we're playing around with inverter settings to allow for an opportunity to make it a little bit more ICE ish, meaning internal combustion engine like, where the torque starts out low, picks up, and falls off. Because you can have an electric one just like that. So if I love speed and I love things that go fast, and I don't mind not having a sound that sounds like an internal combustion engine, even though those sounds are very intoxicating, EV is the way to go. It's fast, it is the future. And don't be surprised if you start seeing a lot of EV offerings from us here at BC Motor Engineering. My favorite Porsche project, hmm, let me divide that into two. One that's really scary to drive is the blue Porsche right there. It was my very first Porsche project. The thing is frightening. Every, every journalist I put into it says that that thing shouldn't even be on the road. It's absolutely fantastically scary to drive. And that makes it really nice and favorable for me. But when it comes to sheer acceleration and fun, this red boxman right here is fantastic. Mid-engine, center seat, absolutely a blast to drive, and that's the second iteration of it, and we have a third that's coming soon. And it's just, it feels like a go-kart on steroids. Uh, it's just a really fun, balanced car, like how every car should be. It's all about the driver, very driver-centric. Hello, Adam Good, you did make it. Thank you so much for joining us. That'd be fantastic. What do you add to fuel tanks to prolong storage? I don't add anything, because I don't want to do anything to hurt the capabilities of the fuel, especially when it comes to color content. So I tend to seal the containers properly and elevate them off the ground. And that helps me get a little bit more out of it. Thank you so much, General Visions. He says, what's up, bro? Love the wagon, amazing, can't wait to see it run. Likewise, it is a great, it's right over there. It's a great 
I would say, project for me because it allows me to think and figure things out and create. There's so much project, product creation coming from that wagon alone. It's just absolutely amazing. And I love that whole sleeper look that it has. So it's going to be a very fun vehicle and one that can allow us to create a lot of great projects. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I know. I make the days before Fast and Furious as well, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much, JP Ferrell. Appreciate the kind words. Hello, Andre from Brazil, I see. Zero Mad Group in Brazil. Thank you so much, CK. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. I'm pretty excited as well, that monster dude about the AW11. It's so weird. I never thought that I'd ever have an MR2 project, even though many of you don't know this, it was the first car I fell in love with when I came to the United States. I just couldn't afford it. So I, please don't kill me, I settled for a CRX. But my first love was a tie between the MR2 and the Fiero. I love that wedge, wedge shape. I love the mid-engine. I understood the physics of a mid-engine and how it's very balanced. And I love the rear-wheel drive aspect. But if you compare the MR2 and the Fiero at the time, even though the Fiero looked pretty cool, it wasn't a very reliable setup from Pontiac. And some of them caught on fire, so that wasn't very good. I bought this Consumer Reports book from a bookstore. Remember those bookstores? And um, I didn't like the reviews, so I said I'd just stay with something more Japanese. Should ED5 be drained and flushed with pump gas? I feel like if I store risk for seven months, that wouldn't be a bad idea, Jim. Um, if, since, once again, the hygroscopic nature of E85, where it doesn't have affinity to absorb moisture from the atmosphere, if you store by extended period of time, you should, what they call, pickle your system, meaning you should flush it with gasoline and leave proper gasoline in there, which is in California closer to E10, which is not so bad. Thank you so much, Fresh Republic, who loves my work. I appreciate the kind word. Cheers as well to you. They call me Tim. Dip and Deep is asking, who's faster, yo? Between who and who? Midnight Grove is asking where the AW11 is, and it's right over there. You can see it right there in the corner. That is the AW11. For those of you on YouTube, I'm sorry that you can't see me move that around. My apologies, you know? Thousand Horsepower Classic Mini, just a thought. You have a death wish, Barawi. That's frightening. You know, a Classic Mini could have 300 horsepower, and it feels like, just because of the sheer horsepower per weight ratio, it feels like 1,000. To have 1,000, oh my God, that would be frightening. Pretty frightening. Uh, hello, Pinky, good seeing you. Who's fashion quarter mile? Deep and deep, who are you comparing to? Please give me some more insights and hopefully I can answer you properly. Shows the Civic. Interesting. Good, hello, Gundavar. Eager to see the wagon. Same here, Automotive Candy. So Automotive Candy, for those of you who don't know, they're the company that helped me tremendously with the rear end of the wagon, which is pretty nice, you know? 996 Outlaw, my pleasure, sir. I'm here to help. Have I ever thought of a VWCK diesel? with a set of compound turbos. I don't have a relationship with Volkswagen, I okay? So because of that, I haven't thought of it. It helps me tremendously when I have a relationship with the manufacturer. And when I have a relationship with a manufacturer, it makes R&D much more easier and cost-effective. They help tremendously in offsetting the cost of us doing a lot of research. So if I don't have that support, it's extremely challenging. And that's one of the problems that I may have with even the Toyota AW1. The fact that I don't have a, I have a decent relationship with TRD, but I don't have a great relationship with American Toyota or Toyota USA, it will be kind of challenging for me to develop components for that car using a newer engine. So I may end up going to a marquee that continues to support me, which could be Honda or Hyundai, which is pretty interesting. Um, Jeff is rebuilding his Delta with some BC more parts. Thank you so much for the support. I really appreciate that. Eight US. T6R is asking, what do I think of Subaru Boxer engines versus a Porsche Boxer engine like the one next to me? They're very similar. One thing I love about the Boxer engines is that they're extremely balanced. So they're opposing cylinders, so you don't have any need for a harmonic balancer. So, you know, right here you can see this engine is just a pulley, which is nice. You don't have any damaging fifth level harmonics that can break crankshafts in those because the balance, the engines are just so well balanced. Meanwhile, in line four, including the wagon van I have, to help offset any damaging harmonics, I do have an ATI damper on the crankshaft, so I don't break things. The one thing about Subaru Boxer engines versus the Porsche Boxer engines, they're very similar construction. I, rumor has it that they even work together on some of their development. Um, I like the Porsche ones because in all things being equal, they have six cylinders and more displacement. So it's much more akin to making great power. Even though you do have H6 engines with Subaru, they're not super popular at this time. Hello, Bruiser, good seeing you. Do I sell the vehicles I build? Many times I do. Um, you may remember the Porsche, blue Porsche 911 I had with the gold wheels. I had a client come here and offer me a mount and I, I couldn't hold back, I, I sold it to him. 
Um, there's a gentleman here, Sam. He bought one of our, um, actually both our fits, Honda fits, which is pretty nice. And then we had a 964 as well. A client came in and offered us a pretty penny for it, and uh, we parted with her as well. How long do I have to wait for rolling shots for the wagon? Can't wait for it. Greens from Germany. Fox Racing, I would love to do it as soon as possible. The one thing is that I've been trying to catch up since SEMA. My company, we have been closed for a majority of the year to help with some pretty big scale projects. And because of that, I'm catching up. I heard, I had, I think, my first proper dyno session with a client yesterday. And with the, all the support from the most recent sales, I'm shipping out a bunch of stuff for the team. And it's just me trying to catch up. And look at this place. I need to tidy this place up. So that being said, me getting rolling shots at the wagon is not a priority for me right now. But I promise you, it's coming very soon. Let me catch up a little bit. Give me a week or so, and we'll have some good shots for you, OK? Do I still tune cars for the public? Yes, Paco. Yesterday I just had a 996 Turbo come in. I'll put that up tomorrow. And yes, I do. So give us a call here at the shop, 888-922-6686, and I'll be more than happy to assist. Serrano so exercising, what sort of emission recon you get on the Cayman? Does it pass Cali regs? I'm an engineer at an OEM, and it's getting quite stringent. Are you concerned about Cali starting to request tuner? I don't even finish your statement, but yeah, my Cayman is not street legal at this point. So that being said, it's not a street faring vehicle. And yes, you cannot get those cars to pass emissions. Whenever you tamper with any emissions equipment, whether it's ECU, catalyst, it's not street legal. That's not street legal, and neither is this as well. Tuners for emission and OBD knock over checks. Well, yeah, same thing. Um, California is very nice now with OBD2, where they allow for uh, redness codes, which is nice. But any time that you have any modifications to any um, emissions equipment, you do not allow yourself to be, I would say, legal anymore. Any more mods for the Odyssey? No, the Odyssey's just been there. Short of me having that most recent change from a, a Turbinex Turbo to a Precision, it's pretty much been the same. I haven't touched the Odyssey recently. A lot of the effort in terms of a Honda-based van type car has been on the wagon. So let's see, Evelon said, I have an idea in my mind to try and figure out a 1.6 EcoBoost swap for an AW11, but I'm thinking my C52 wouldn't be able to hold that much power. Is flipping the transmission upside down viable? It depends. So most of the time you can do that, you could flip it, but an adapter plate may be a better way to go. Um, so that being said, the EcoBoost, just, there's so many options for you. If you were trying to do an EcoBoost, you know what I would do if I were you? I'll put an EcoBoost 1.6 engine, I'll opt for a Quaif gearbox, a Quaif sequential. They make one that fits the EcoBoost engine. It completely transforms the car entirely. Um, if it's on your budget, save up, do it. It's a night and day experience. Our friends at Mountain, um, they can import some from, for you and make your project even more exciting, you know? Any updates on the Turbo Viper build or is it no longer in the works? It's still on the hiatus right now, so no updates yet. I'll definitely keep you posted. Uh, when you were Spike and Zuckerman, did Spike kind of come off as a holier than thou? Sometimes he's much too much to listen to. No, Clay. Um, Spike, first has actually been great. I had the opportunity to, to participate with them in, a, in a, uh, a very nice podcast. I was slightly tardy getting there, which is really sad. Traffic wasn't in my favor. But Spike is really cool. He doesn't seem that way. He really is a true enthusiast. And I've heard that from other people. But with me, he's been absolutely spectacular. I've not had any challenges whatsoever. And Zuckerman is awesome. What a great chap. Very nice guy, you know? Otto Wong Man is building a 97 Integra LS as a cheap endurance race car. How would you recommend in terms of power mods on a budget? So definitely the straightforward things to do with engine management solution, exhaust, and intake. Those three things can make you very, 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 very successful. Exhaust, and that includes header and exhaust system. And intake that flows much better than factory and engine management solution. That will get you there. Many people here come to tune with um, Honda Challenge vehicles and they do extremely well with, with that I would say, ingredient system. Who is faster, I or Duran? That's strange. Uh, Duran doesn't really race, you know? Um, Cali Man is asking, where did I find that wagon? My friends from um, uh, right here, not too far away, from Buddy Club, provided it to us. Are you coming out with any L15 goodies? JDM, I have quite a, f oh my goodness, L15? Now, if you're talking about old school L15, like the one at the GE, GD, or even GK, Wow, pulse chambers, rods, if you go on a website, valve train, camshafts, pistons. I even have pistons on sale for like, I think it was like $349 for a set. It's just, we have a lot. Intake manifolds, intake heat shielding gaskets, a lot for the L15. Now, if you're talking about later gen L15, the L15T, that's in the 10th gen Civic and the newer Accords, we have cat bypasses and downpipes. 
Send me a PM and I'll be more than happy to assist you, you know? Is Porsche my favorite car brand? Thanks. I find appeal for many more keys. And let's talk about that a little bit. When they say for Porsche there's no substitute, that's a very nice moniker to really describe it. There's something about Porsche, something about the soul of a Porsche which is very nice. It's a brand that's extremely prestigious. A majority of Porsches are still on the road, which is fantastic. They constantly reinvent themselves, which is amazing as well. And it's just a great brand. Um, the one thing about the Porsche community is that they're not crazy enthusiasts where they want to go crazy with their cars. Very few people go bonkers. Which brings me to the marquee. We took a look at the Honda world. Those guys are bananas. They will cut up their car, they make it all-wheel drive, they will go crazy with swaps, they'll cut mounts off, they'll put a K-series in the older chassis. They're pure, really bred enthusiasts. And the Honda brand is great because their engines have such a strong foundation. They would never believe the engine is a Honda, what we could be able to extract from those engines. And so a very strong base makes for a very reliable, successful project. When it comes to Hyundai, look at where they came from the Excel to today. Great brand. They had a lot of partnerships with Mitsubishi in the past. They're now creating their own engine and power plants. And my daily is a hybrid from Hyundai. I find them appealing. I find appeal for many marquees. I am not a Porsche only guy, a Honda only guy, a Hyundai only guy, a Ford only guy, a Dodge Viper only guy. I am just a car person who loves marquees. And I see value and advantages in each marquee, which is pretty nice. So I hope that answers your question very nicely, you know? Thank you so much, B. Dodd, for the kind words about the wagon. I really appreciate that, you know? What would be a good engine swap for a Mini Cooper, not a classic Mini? <laughs> the truth? A K-Series Honda engine. <laughs> I think that'd be pretty good, you know? Honda's the best, says good buddy, right? Honda's for life. <laughs> That's, wow, that monster dude had an AW11 at 16. You are very fortunate, you know? What does AM ECUs offer for drag racing traction control compared to fuel tech, how tech? So, one thing I like about the AM system is how it has the ability to have a very nice slew rate control. So, if you have certain sanctioning bodies that don't allow you to have wheel to wheel biases, like what you may see with the how tech elite, the AM allows you to have a very nice third step, almost like a third step rev limit, that limits traction based upon the acceleration of your RPM gauge or acceleration, delta acceleration of RPM. So, when you have an RPM delta that's very fast or short in duration, the ECU can see that as an event where you're having a lot of tire slippage and it can retard timing, do a fuel cut or ignition cut or a combination of those three at your leisure. So I found that very exciting as well. So that's one thing for drag racing that I find appealing. Some drag racing sanctioning bodies will not allow you to have a wheel to wheel sensor as an advantage for, drag, for traction control. Also, the AEM has the ability to have, if you go with Infinity, to have you control that. And by the way, the slew rate is in both Series 1, Series 2, and the Infinity. But Infinity has the capability of doing traction control based upon throttle position as well. Or, I would say, driver wire throttle position. Thank you so much, Brainstorm. Excited to see that as well. Oh, you should get another one, Pinky. Wagons are so awesome. My logo is back with Phoenix hopefully soon. I'm uh, tuning up exhaust, adding good. Oh, good, 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 good. I'm sure they're in great hands with Daz. Good seeing adding good, fantastic. Do I have open house shows to meet and see our builds? Got to catch up events? That's a good idea, JP. Let me put some pen to paper and talk to the team and see what we can do to make that happen. We've given a lot of requests for that. It's just really crazy here. The only time I cannot do um, open houses is when we have secret projects here, which we had one for a majority of the year and I couldn't let people hear. Hello, Kerbin, good seeing you. Wow, Automotive KMD's first car was an 89 MR2 supercharged. Well done. Wanted to start a GSR into it after he spent a crap ton of money with Toy Sport. I remember Toy Sport. They had a facility right here in Gardena. It was not so bad, you know? Yeah, I've heard quite a bit about that with the uh, second gen MR2. Um, some consider that the third gen, but how people are having a hard time getting those engines to run very well. I get emails all the time and PMs about people asking me to really swap that engine out and get rid of the 4 AGE. Oh well. Hello, Fabian from Costa Rica. Good seeing you. Beautiful. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that. And I look forward to exceeding your expectations with components. Good to see you as well, Pinky. Thank you so much. So Jim Gang is kind of saying he's on the way to LA. Can you visit the shop? Let me know when. Um, this week is pretty crazy, so it may not be good. But if you're a little bit, a couple weeks from now, then maybe we can make something happen during the holidays. Thank you, Ron, for the kind words. What is the most power I can get from a stock L-Series engine? Stock has never been my forte because I'm a huge advocate of really, how should I say, reinforcing any shortcomings of an engine to make my project worthwhile. So I always begin with the end in mind. If I want to make 400 horsepower, I don't just throw a turbo on it. I sleeve the block, pistons, rods, I build it properly. I have never had 
a fit engine, an L engine, where I just laid it stock and just added to it. The closest I've done is with a pulse chamber exhaust, and I gave seven wheel horsepower with just the exhaust system alone. If I had to guess, based upon my knowledge of single cam engines of earlier models, being like a, the D series into the L series, I would say with a camshaft intake exhaust um, upgrade, you may gain 15% more power thereabout uh, without opening up the bottom end. 15, maybe 20, using some kind of fuel system that would be more akin to E85. So I hope that helps. Is it cost effective to build an NA F22B to around 300 horsepower? Not for F22B1. The ports are not the best on that. You can do that um, somewhat with an F22A because the intake and exhaust ports lend themselves better to flow and to that kind of power goals you want. So whether you're looking at 300 wheel or 300 um, to the crank, it's, it's easier to use the F22A. The first time I put my F22A on the dyno, just taking my D-series knowledge and applying it to F22A, it made 280 horsepower to the wheel on the dyno jet. It was just without even thinking. And all I did with the bottom end is keep it alone and change camshafts and intake, and I kept increasing that power way past the 300 mark. K24 or K20? Dan the man, K24. I like the displacement, and even if you do something like the wagon where you use a D-stroke crank from Eagle, I like the deck height of the K24. It allows you to put a longer rod and have a better rod ratio. Hello, Alfie. Thank you for joining us. Good seeing you. What is the highest shot of nitrous you would go with on a build of D-Series coming on progressively? So it depends. If it's a build D-Series, you can have all the fun you want. You can go direct port. You can do 100 shot per cylinder if you want to. Now, if you're doing a dry system or wet system, when it gets to 75 horsepower or higher, because of distribution, I'm happier going individual port. If it's a stock engine, you may want to stay with that 75 shot and keep it there. Um, so, obi ones are saying that, how did I learn engine design as a chemical engineer? Well, that is a whole story to itself. We could spend the whole hour here, which is coming to a close very soon. We can spend a lot of time doing that. Um, I'll give you a condensed version of that. Chemical engineering allows me the capability of having a very strong basis in the different engineering disciplines. A chemical engineer has the ability to design components and facilities to take raw materials and create useful products. And to do that, you have to have a very strong knowledge of chemistry, of course, because most processes involving chemicals are rooted in chemistry. And you have to understand mechanical engineering because you do have to design components and plants, which leads you to civil engineering as well. So you have to have some disciplines in civil engineering. Those components have to be wired up. So you have to have a basis in electrical engineering. Physics is also something that you have to be very strong in as well. In addition to that, the study of energy as it relates to matter. And as you think about it in design, we had to take statics classes. We had to take classes in, 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 in drafting at the time when I went to school. So it gives you a very well-balanced understanding of the different engineering disciplines. And because of that, it allows me to look at engines in different light. So instead of looking at an engine as a mechanical device where you just bolt on parts, as I mentioned earlier in our interaction today, I see it as an energy conversion device. Now, if you're having an energy conversion device and you want to make it more powerful, as a chemical engineer, what do you do? You find ways of making things more efficient. And if you open up any of my engines, you see extensive uses of coatings to help with that efficiency. I partnered with the company Purell because it's an aerospace company and they are very, very big. We're using oils that have tremendous amount of opportunities to reduce friction and keep heat where it needs to belong and pull away pollutants and have very high chemical resilience and very high uh, uh, heat resilience. So I'm very big on that. So chemical engineering gave me the foundation because it allows me to interact with other disciplines to be a better designer, a better engineer when it comes to things automotive. If you're an ME, you kind of stay in that whole ME bubble. If you're CECS, you kind of stay there. If you're EE, you kind of stay there. But as chemical engineering, you have to take all these disciplines. You have to take all these curriculums in different disciplines. It makes me a better engineer. What's the best gearbox ratio for an all-motor D-series? I would say the first generation, in terms of ratios and also strength, first generation Integra, which is the 86 to 89 Integra. That's what I would use, and that's what I use in my own Insight, and I use in my CRX as well. What's the first car I started doing work on? The first car that caught my interest instead of doing what I'm doing? The first car that caught my interest was the MR2 AW1, first gen MR2. The first car I worked on was a 200SX Nissan. Thank you so much, Easy Savvy. I appreciate that, you know? 
Uh, try to find stock camshafts for the AW1. There are no more cars on the planet. <laughs> you can go for a cam setup on a stock engine. Rewind some user race cams. To speak. That's correct. That's very true. That's the way to go. You know. How does a young, hungry, motivated single dad with a full custody get involved in the mastermind, mastermind known as BC Moto? Zani, first, it depends on where you are. If you're remote from us, this interaction is absolutely fantastic. If you're local to us, maybe you can work with us here. Just send me your resume to lab at bcmoto.com and maybe you can be part of the team, which is pretty nice, you know? Would I ever consider building an older, I would drive all track Corolla sedan wagon? Yes, I would, especially if I have a relationship with American Toyota. Uh, which the push of people wanting your parts, are you leaning towards keeping parts on the shelf? Has dipping deep? I have. So one thing, I had a good discussion yesterday with Angel, and for those of you who are in the great LA area, you may have heard of his facility. And Angel has this very nice place, new called Nemo's Garage, and he sells a lot of parts to a lot of enthusiasts, big JDM guy. And he was like, wow, BC, I was surprised to see you build the wagon. And I reminded him that, as I remind you now, I never stepped away from the Honda world. My parts have always really been on the, on the, on the shelf. I've always supported the Honda world. If there are times that my site was either down for maintenance or that we had crazy projects and I couldn't really address any retail sales, we'd pull the site and put in a bit of a, how should I say, hiatus uh, until we're back in town again. So that being said, I've never stopped supporting you guys. So it will continue to have that. Um, Oh, thank you so much, Pinky. Appreciate the kind words, by all means. Oh, 15 and 16, please my greetings to them. Does higher displacement more potential for reliable power when boosted? Yes, it is. So one thing about higher displacement, all things being equal, is it allows you to create more power with less boost. It's about moving air. And displacement, larger displacement, allows you to move air very nicely. My pleasure, Fox. What's the best final drive for an all-motor build? Now, that is really a very broad question, Kervin. All motor, are you doing half mile? Are you doing street? Are you doing drag racing? Are you doing road racing? What tire sizes you're running? What weight of the car? All that has to dictate what final drive you use. Especially wheel size, as in diameter of your wheel and tire, the tire interface to be exact, and also what you're doing with the car. I set up my drag cars to finish in fourth gears at the strip. So to do that, I've had drag race cars everywhere from 4.2 final drives, to 5.8. So it depends on so many factors. And the 5.8 final drive was a car that ran 28 inch slicks. The 4.2 final drive was a car that ran 23 inch slicks. So it depends. Too many variables. Hopefully I can help you if you give me a little bit more information on what you're trying to do. You know? You know, I've been waiting for the write up on the wagon. Have you done, done that yet? So get body right. There are two places you can see it. Super Street at SEMA did a little synapse of the wagon which you can see on the Super Street website. If you go on the BC Motor YouTube feed, on any of the videos, whether it's the walk around I had at SEMA or the first startup that we did with our friends from AM Induction, or AM Intakes, in the, in the description, I put every component, every component that allowed me to build that car. So you can definitely see that without problems, you know? I can't wait to get the clutches in as well, Automotive Candy. I look forward to really putting that to the test and giving people more options for CRV and elements and cross tours. And for guys like us who do crazy swaps. What turbo would I recommend for a D16 A6 shooting for 300 to 330? I would say the Turbonetics TNX20. Um, if you have a hard time finding those, just, no, and just write to me. I can probably get you a good deal on those. And the TNX20 is a T25. Um, it's what I, I have two of them on this right here. Um, it's a very nice turbo to get you there. It spools super quick. It's internally gated, so you don't have to worry about having crazy wastegates everywhere. And very reliable. Um, as a matter of fact, I will grab a housing right here. This is a housing for one of the um, TNX turbos. So as you see, it's a T25 inlet right there. It has a very nice design in terms of the turbine housing. It has a V-band outlet, so it's very easy for you to be able to create an exhaust for it. And whenever you have to service, it's very simple to do that as well, which is pretty nice. Why are you laughing, Alfie? You're too good. In California, AJ Thompson, stun loans are not smuggling, or neither are certain flashes. Cheers to you as well, PW, PBW forever. Good seeing you. My pleasure, Serrano. Good seeing you. What's my opinion on the best intake for K24? It depends. If you're looking for something NA, Kinsler. You can't go bad with Kinsler at all. If you're boosted, what I do, which is the Gonigo intake manifold. Quite straightforward. Thank you. My thoughts on Jamie Marsh. I don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> have you considered building an older all-wheel drive ultra Corolla? Yes, Dickie, we just talked about that. Um, I haven't because I don't have a relationship with American Toyota, so I'm so sorry. 
Um, ever thought about a Wago Van gathering? Ooh, Emez, that's a good that's a good idea. We may have to do that. We have to do that. Steve eight four eight sending love from Canada. I'm gonna give that very good thought, Emez. If you have a pre nineteen ninety six diesel car, smog exempt, and do a petrol engine swap, is it legal? So in California, here's what happens. Your car is legal based upon the engine you put in. So if you put a petrol engine in California into your diesel chassis, you have to go to a ref, like a referee in California, and they have to certify that that engine meets the chassis, I would say, meets the standards of that engine. So if you have an engine that's a petrol engine from, let's say, 2006, whatever the emission laws were and components, whether it's a charcoal canister, EVAP, whatever needs to be in that engine, together engine to make it legal, has to be in that chassis. So that's how things happen here in California. Hello, Delane, good seeing you all the way from Europe. Honda Banana, I don't know what that means. Any thoughts on January? I don't know who you're talking about, Kerbin. I really don't know who you're speaking of. Um, if there's an all motor record, that's, I don't know, I don't know. You have to educate me on that, but I'm not familiar with it. Um, the all motor cars I know that are super fast, like Jeremy, who runs eights, um, Norris, who's done eights, um, on a single cam, we did 920s, um, all motor single cam, and I still have stuck glass and unibody, so, but I don't know, if there's something, if there's something faster than 8.8, .8, I'm not familiar with it, or 8.80 or 8.7, I'm not familiar with it. Um, K-Series, yes, 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 yes. Hello, Xavier, good seeing you. Thank you so much, B-Dot, appreciate the kind words, you know? Um, I know the intake and exhaust ports for the L15 are a lot smaller than the D-Series, and it's hard to borrow because the walls are so thin. It depends, the, you know, We've done crazy things with ports in the, in the vein of making lots of power, and the one way to know how to go crazy with ports is take a head and cut in half. So I typically have to sacrifice a head if I'm going to do something really crazy in terms of design and racing to see what we can get away with. But the key to making power is flow, period. Opinion on the Hyundai and sub-brand, I think it's pretty amazing. They, they really grabbed some great talent from BMW. I think it's Beerman. He used to be the head of the BMW M division and he's now part of the end division from Hyundai, I feel it'll really give that brand a nice boost and show that they're more serious about motorsports. So I think it's a good thing. I also think that there's gonna be opportunity to make products, which we should, for those vehicles as well, especially the Velosta. What are my plans for the MR2? So Diling, you came a little bit later, but I haven't decided yet. I know that I'm gonna stay in line four. I'm gonna build it for next year. We already started already by putting the engine out. Um, I haven't decided if I'm gonna stay with the Toyota brand it's very likely that I'll go with a different marquee that's more supportive in putting that kind of engine inside that chassis. Oh, you got your gasket, well done. Thank you so much, I hope you love it. It's great, I love those gaskets indeed. Um, have I, um, I want, Dickie, you've asked this question three times, so I'll tell you, no I haven't considered, and it'll be very difficult if I don't have a relationship with Toyota. Hello Xavier, I know Heifer, that was the way to go. Heifer was the nickname, HFR for the First CRX that I raced, and Xavier and I used to race quite a bit. He's breed XO, you know? Oh, wow, I look forward to that real red. He said he can't wait for his guy to bring in his J35. That is cool. I love to see that. He's been a 63 Falcon, daily driven, with a J35 paired to Miata Trans. That would be an awesome project. Beautiful. Things are well, Rand DC2. Good seeing you, good seeing you. How much decrease in intake tents have I seen with my thermogastic? I've seen from 10 to 15 degrees in Fahrenheit reduction, which is very nice. You can even grab, the only heat transfer that happens is through the bolts, and that is very minimal. But you can grab the intake manifold after, wow, significant driving, which is pretty cool. Especially on a dyno. Thank you so much, David, I appreciate that. I need to buy an intake and throttle for my K24A4. What do I recommend? Um, it depends if you're NA. If you're NA, as I mentioned earlier, I would go with the um, individual throttle body from Kinsler. If you're boosted, just like I did, go to Nevo. And in terms of throttle body, um, I've done something as crazy as a big Mustang for racing, which I have on the Black Civic um, Life Gen I'm looking at right here. On mine, I went with a 46 milli I'm not sorry, not 46, but a 76 millimeter throttle body that's drive-by-wire on the wagon. I converted, yeah, I converted the wagon to drive-by-wire. I should really talk more about that, which is pretty cool, you know? I need to do it, Hermes. That's a good idea. That'd be a good idea. Yes, I would, I think, good be interested in seeing the Dunnish sheet when you do switch over to Pirol, by all means. Hello, Hyundai 818, good seeing you. Any Wago Van parts for sale? Let me know. Wow, did you just miss a great sale? We had so many great sales this past weekend on Black Friday. I literally lost my mind. I had pots and camshafts and intake gaskets. Actually, a secret to you guys, I extend the intake gasket sale. So if you go there now, you can still get intake heat shielding gaskets for like $24 shift. 
within the US, maybe Canada, but overseas, there's a little, you know, I would say price you have to pay for shipping, a little bit more, not too much. Is it a good idea, Fabian asks, Fabian FG, going turbo on F22B or putting an H22NA, which is better and which would get better numbers? Stock internals? F22B boosted would. You can literally boost your F22B stock. Um, I would upgrade valve springs. A cam would be nice, but with stock bottom end internals, you can get close to 400. You can get 380 all day. Um, H22NA, no. The limitation of H22 is the valve train. The, the valve angles don't lend themselves to very large camshafts. Um, because the head was designed to allow for hood clearance, the valve angles are quite radical, and if you go to very large lift camshafts or even oversized valves, they tend to interact. So in the meantime, you can run on the F22B you have. If you go crazy with camshafts in the future, you can go up to 600 lift and not have any problems, which is pretty amazing. Oh my God, time is flying. Let me see if we can get to a couple more questions. Is the L15 related D-Series? It is the, I would say, the D-Series is a grandfather to the L-Series, so it is an advancement of the D-Series. Making a G63 beams California smog legal, that could be an expensive excursion, but it can be done. Um, Kirby, Kirby, you asked this question, I don't know who this is. For, if there's a guy this Marsh person, let me know what happened, or maybe I'll look into it, but I have no idea about this record. And if he's faster than 8.7, that's really fast. All motor, 8.7 or faster, if that's what he did, that's really fast. But I don't know this new record, I haven't heard of it. Um, do I ever use negative pressure to pull the pistons back into the block, or is that more a motorsports concept? So Clay, to answer your question, I do something a little different. On my inside, yes, I do use vacuum, so negative pressure or vacuum, to create an opportunity to not only create an atmosphere where the pistons have less to work against, but tell you what, the one huge opportunity for loss of power in an engine are frictions with the rings. That's why proper oils like Pyro makes such a big difference above and beyond that. If you use lower tension rings, you can free up a lot of power. On my Insight, a lot of people don't know this, I run a two ring piston setup because the center ring, reducing that, taking that away, allows me to create more power. So I have a top ring, which allows me for seal. I have an oil control ring, which is very low tension. And without a vacuum pump, the car would smoke like crazy. So to allow me to take advantage of the lower tension to create power and also to create an environment where the piston doesn't have to work against atmospheric pressure, I create a vacuum my crankcase, which is about anywhere from 13 to 18 inches. Anything more than that, it creates an opportunity where it's harder for the pistons to suck back up, and it's kind of hard on my seals. So that being said, yes, I have. And you know what? How much power we gain doing that? 23 wheel horsepower on an inline four F22A from just using a vacuum pump and reducing friction via rings. Amazing. You know what you have to do, NA, to get 24 horsepower? A lot, especially if you're putting engines at almost the edge where you're maximizing compression and camshaft design, and intake design, exhaust designs, you know? So Geisha, I mentioned that before about the best intake manifold. I mentioned uh, Kinsler's for INA, and also I mentioned using Goneal for boosted, you know? Um, what engine should I start off for a budget? If you are, so if, if a Honda engine for a budget, my choice is F22A. Um, if you want to really go crazy, I would say you can find probably some cost-effective K24 bottom ends from the CRV or Element and scouring around the forums or the recyclers or um, wrecking yards or even online through OfferUp or Recycler to find a K24A2 head. That would be a very nice opportunity for you as well. But if you don't have that capability, you can pick up F22A engines for 100 bucks. Some people throw them away and they are very, very good. Um, best final drive curve in for a D6 no motor, as I mentioned before, it, it depends on what you're doing with the car and your tire size, you know? Thank you so much, d -Ling. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you so much. So guys, oh my God, it's, it's time for me to depart. So thank you so much for joining me in this exciting episode of BCMO Tech Tuesday. I look forward to seeing you guys next Tuesday. And, um, you know, stay calm out there. Do the best you can. Thank you very much for the support. If you have any feedback on what we can do to make this program better, let us know. In the meantime, take care and have a great balance of the week. Cheers.